This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are discussing with Jonathan Last, his new book, What to Expect When No One's Expecting, America's Coming Demographic Disaster. Jonathan Last is a senior writer at the Weekly Standard, and he is widely published. His writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and the Claremont Review of Books, among others. He lives outside of Washington, D.C., and he tells us in very unhip fashion, drives a minivan. Jonathan, glad to have you. Hey, Richard. I, I want to ask you, you, you begin the book in two interesting ways. Um, one is the story of Old Town Alexandria, which I guess uh, is close to where you live, where we have um, uh, people trying to stop boutique children's shops, and they quickly close down, but yet uh, boutique pet shops thrive and, uh, and quickly outnumber the children's shops, and, there, and there's a, a variety of market choices and, and just really intricate uh, ways that you can have a consumer experience with your dog in these stores. Uh, and, and you kind of start to think about conclusions. What, what, what does that mean about, say, America's overall fertility? If you have one of these super zips, uh, I think Old Town Alexandria would be a super zip the way Charles Murray describes in Coming Apart. Um, s- successful people, highly educated people, healthy people, but extremely low levels of fertility, choosing childlessness. And then you also, uh, opening, you, you, you talk about China's one-child policy and the horrors of that. And I want to get into China later in this discussion um, more in-depthly. But you, you mentioned we also have a one-child policy if you look at college-educated women in America who have a birth rate, a fertility rate, I think if I remember correctly, 1.56. So we actually have our own one-child policy. And this becomes a basis in your book for you know, thinking about our demographic uh, problems. Um, so why, wh- 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 why do you start the book, though, it seems, in thinking about the Old Town Alexandria problem? Uh, why begin in that fashion and not, say, look broadly, more broadly in America at a lot of more, you know, say, diverse locales that might paint kind of a different picture? You know, I wish I had a really sexy, high-minded answer for this, but the simple answer is that <laughs> I, I used to live in Old Town Alexandria okay. back when I was blissfully child-free. Uh, it was great. God, it was. You so had to great. move to the soulless suburbs. Yeah, no, and so we, yeah, my yeah. wife and I, we we did five glorious child-free years, which I look back on as really the best five years of my life in Old Town Alexandria. And we walked everywhere on the weekends to the to the market to pick up our organic kale and to the coffee shops. I mean, my God, this place had coffee shops. You can't even imagine. <laughs> and uh, and then we had a kid. And uh, we did one year in our little sexy riverfront condo with our kid. And at the end of that year, we realized that if we tried to do two years, uh, three of us would not survive. Uh, it's not clear whether two of us might make it out of alive or just one, but, but someone was going to die if we had to do another year in this condo. And so we moved out to the soulless suburbs, which are, you know, every bit as soulless and maybe even more soulless than people might realize. And, uh, you know, it's nothing but big box stores and strip balls. And, you know, my God, we bought a minivan. And it's just the worst thing in the world. Uh, but on the <laughs> other hand, you know, you can raise kids out there because for, you know, for a, a single salary, if you need it, uh, and certainly on, on a dual income, you can get an actual house with bedrooms for everybody and a front yard and a backyard where you can put a swing set to send the kids outside to get a little bit of break from them. And, uh, and so that's where we are. You know, I, the condo good development we lived in, in Old Town, had, I think, 225 units in it when we were living there. And I think there were three children in those 225 condo units. Uh, we live on a cul-de-sac, which is, I mean, we're so suburban where we live now. It's, we live off of a, a cul-de-sac, off of a cul-de-sac, off of a cul-de-sac. None of the roads go through anywhere. <laughs> like, it's, like all the, you know, the, liber- the liberal arguments about, against urban planning in the suburbs, all of them totally apply to this. But when you turn into this development, you see a sign which says, watch for children, entire community. And on our cul-de-sac, which has, I believe, uh, 12 houses, there are 16 kids. Yeah. Yeah. So, no. I mean, all the, cli- <laughs> the lesson to take away, all the cliches are true. All the cliches are true. So, I, I want to ask you, in just uh, thinking about your numbers, and I, I, I don't doubt any of your facts based on my knowledge and from what I've 
read. Um, but I just thought at the beginning, how do we get the data for fertility rates? I mean, is there any controversy within the demographic community about how we arrive at, say, you know, Poland has a total fertility rate of 1.2? I mean, what's, is there any sort of conversation there? There is. It, it's not controversy, but I, I, I try to sort of unpack this in the beginning of the book without, without burdening people with too much math, because the truth is you, the average reader doesn't need as much math really to get through the subject as somebody who's studying it does. So the f- total fertility rate is a statistical construct, uh, and it isn't real. It isn't a real number. The total fertility rate is the number of children that the average woman in a society has over the course of her lifetime. But what that really means is it means that if every woman alive today at this moment made it through her childbearing years alive, that is the number of children she would probably have. And so to arrive at this, you actually are taking a whole bunch of different data sets and mixing them and doing some alchemy and coming out with a number. And this is why actually total fertility numbers, when they come out, always lag two years behind typically the actual data. And so what I, what I say in the book is <clears throat> perfectly valid, you know, smart statistical bodies the CDC in the census, for instance, will put out fertility rates for a given year, for like, you know, for 2008 or something. And they, they may differ by a few hundred points, maybe even a tenth of a point. And so we never want to get caught up in the actual numbers. We will never want to say, oh, but in 2007, the fertility rate went up by one-tenth of a percent. So there is something there. Da, da, da. What we really always want to do when we talk about the TFR is look at the trends and, you know, take a 30,000-foot view look at the trends over time, understand that there are going to be, you know, statistical things happening here and there. And when you want really hard numbers, the hardest numbers there are are what are called completed fertility for individual cohorts. And so what you would do is you would look, for instance, at women born between the years of 1965 and 1969, and you wait then until the last, the youngest of those people crosses the three age threshold of 44, which is typically where women stop having children in any significant numbers. Uh, and then you count up the completed fertility and find out what their average fertility was during that cohort. And so that's the, the most solid numbers. The problem is it's hard to get those numbers. There are long lags on them. Uh, but those are the best numbers. And, you know, I, I say in the book, yeah, you know, we use the TFR as our guide the way many demographers do, but we always must understand the limitations and understand that it's a statistical construct. But it, and it also seems, as, as you say, uh, I mean, the trends are so obvious that, you know, any sort of discrepancy probably aren't worth bickering about, and we all kind of know where things are standing. Where right, and you see other, yeah. you know, like big things like the crude fertility rate or the, yeah. the birth rate. Like these, there are, believe me, there are a thousand different metrics that you can use for all this stuff, and some of them are more useful than others. Uh, but what I always say in the book is, you know, uh, please let's not get caught up in the, the tiny thousandth of a of yeah. percent difference here and there. Let's, you know, look at the numbers, use the numbers the best we can, and, uh, and, you know, look at the bigger trends. So right now in America, and, and this is post-2008 America, um, although I think, I think we've probably been sub-replacement fertility for a while uh, beyond 2008, if, if I'm remembering uh, your data correctly. But definitely post-2008, we are below replacement level in fertility. I think you say we're at one point. Nine three, and it would be even worse because a huge part of the that number, uh, not a huge part, but a substantial part, is actually uh, immigrants to America and, and even illegal immigrants uh, to America. If the trends hold, you say 2050 America writ large, we look like Florida. I mean, that's 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 something to, to be concerned about. Obviously, <laughs> what yeah. would? But let's let's talk. So we have the decline. I mean, there's there's demographic momentum, which is something you talk about. Um, and so we've got a baby boom generation, which is massive. Uh, they, they sustain us for a while in terms of overall population. Uh, but when the demographic momentum, their generation begins to die off, then we've got a problem. Um, or they move in, you know, they, they die off, they move into their senior years, which they're now starting to do. We've got a big problem. Uh, talk about that. I mean, because that's really where you seem to stress. There's a, it's, it's an overall change in society and the structure and composition of the society with low sub-replacement f- fertility yeah. levels. Yeah, and that's, I mean, the big concern with the fertility rate, population contraction is a concern, but the, the real concern is what happens first, and that's the inversion of your age profile. If you think about what a normal, so think about this, think about a country with a fertility rate that is constantly at replacement, so at the two-point level constantly with no immigration, no inflows, just sort of a normal steady state country, your population structure looks like the Washington Monument, where the base is basically the same height, tapering narrowly as you get older, and then getting very narrow at the top, because you're at the very old ages where people die off very fast. Uh, 
what happens when you have a consistently low fertility rate, and we have been sub-replacement in America since 1973. We have touched the top of replacement uh, maybe, I think, three years during that, whole, during that entire span, uh, and even that was largely driven by immigration. Uh, what happens when you're below replacement for a prolonged period of time is that your, your age structure no longer looks like the Washington Monument. It looks like one of the great pyramids of Giza flipped upside down. You wind up with many more old people than young people. Uh, and you want to see a sort of clear example of where this is. Look at Japan. Japan has that right now. Uh, last year, in Japan, people bought more diapers for adults than they did diapers for babies. Uh, they are going to, I think it's about 15 years in Japan, they will, for every infant born that year, they will have a person turning 100. So they will have as many centarians every year as they do newborns. Uh, and this is what creates all sorts of problems. It creates problems in countries like ours, which have you know, well-developed entitlement system, uh, systems because it becomes impossible to maintain those. Uh, it then creates economic problems. Uh, it turns out having a very old society is an economic drag for a whole bunch of reasons. It declines. Uh, you wind up with declines in demand for just about everything but health care. Productivity decreases because you're losing uh, the cohorts of people who are typically our entrepreneurs and innovators, and because your capital pools begin to shrink and dry up because older people aren't investing capital over a long term, they're, they're actually drawing down. Uh, and so this is, this is the real concern. The concern is winding up, not, not that America needs to buy Nigeria. We don't need a fertility rate of six. We don't need constantly growing populations. What we do need is to get to a place where the age profile becomes a stable, sustainable thing, where we are not in that upside-down pyramid. And that, that's why I wrote the book, to call attention to, you know, hey, we've got this problem. It's a global problem. Lots of other countries are grappling with this already. You go over to Asia, you go to Europe. This is sort of topic A. This is what all the public policy is, is arranged around. We've been insulated uh, to a large degree about this conversation in America because of immigration, because immigration has been so helpful to us. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are some problems with immigration, and it, it, for all the good it has done us, it, it may not last. On Japan, I mean, so they are now actually losing population and have been for so a decade at least. Is that right. correct? Okay. Japan Japan is shrinking. Italy is shrinking. Russia is shrinking. Yeah. Uh, so you see this, this, it's already happening across the world. And the societies that are shrinking aren't doing great. So l- let me ask you, could it be the case that capital-rich countries like Japan, America, Germany, um, could they actually find a way out or a partial answer by merely finding labor-rich countries and investing their capital in them? Uh, and, and allowing returns. I mean, now that's <clears throat> that's kind of a, an extended process, and would require some other you know uh, institutions to develop international institutions. But they could actually find a way out, maybe uh, through a process of actually uh, you know loading their capital where it needs to be and letting sufficient returns come to take care of them. Also, I was going to ask you, uh, really in Japan, it seems that they're really placing a lot of hope on robots. To take care of the elderly people. And, of course, as you know, (laughs) Germany in some parts is training prostitutes to take care of their elderly. Yes, yes. We should all be old German men. Yeah, you know, so the the answer is, is immigration the the solution? The answer is yes and no. On the one hand, immigration can be enormously beneficial and can help you prop up things. Uh, On the other hand, I'm going to do a series of, like, total, like, you know, wishy-washy economists on the one hand and the other hand. On the other hand, uh, it radically changes your society. The Japanese, for instance, have almost no immigration. And if your fertility rate is where the Japanese fertility rate is, you know, 1.3, which is where it's been over the course of uh, you know, several decades now, for you to start allowing immigration at the levels it would need to be in order to get yourself out of the demographic fix you're in, uh, then within 40 years, Japan would no longer be Japanese in any meaningful way. Uh, you know, Japan is fixed to lose about 58% of its population over the course of the next century. Uh, just imagine what, you know, what the country looks like and the sort of social dislocations that happen if you're importing uh, 58% of people from different cultures. It creates all sorts of problems. Uh-huh. Uh, but I would say even aside from that, uh, there is a supply side issue here, and that is that the fertility collapse is a global phenomenon. It is happening everywhere. It's happening in the developed world as well as the industrialized world. And in fact, in many parts of the developed world, or the developing world, rather, uh, it is a faster rate of decline than the decline we're seeing in the industrialized world. So where, you know, down in South America, there may be a country which has a higher absolute fertility rate than we do, uh, their rate of overall decline is steeper. And so everybody, everybody worldwide is rushing down and circling the drain together. The question then becomes, what happens with patterns of migration 
between massively sub-replacement societies. Uh, and we don't know. What we do know is that historically, sub-replacement societies tend not to send immigrants out into the world at the same rates as far above replacement societies. And so long term, it actually may not be feasible to continue to import, uh, you know, import bodies that way. But the other the other problem is that uh, there's been some reasonably sophisticated math and research showing that immigration, while it helps your fertility rate and while it helps with all sorts of other things, uh, it, it's a Band-Aid, but it is not a substitute because what it does not provide is the same rejuvenation effect to the age profile. And so you can, in certain circumstances, wind up importing lots of immigrants and actually making your age profile problems worse, depending on you know, the the number of immigrants and the ages that they are when they come in. So is that, now, is that because their reproduction patterns reduce to the mean of the country? Well, it's that, but also just think of it this way. Uh, think of your, you know, your Washington Monument. Well, when you're bringing people in, maybe, say, at age 22 as opposed to age zero, you're creating then bulges in the population profile, uh, which, which okay. aren't the same then as having those people there throughout the whole, the whole okay. thing of their lives. Uh, and so, so I would say all these... Are, it's, it's that complicated way of saying immigration is vital and essential. We would be even more screwed than we are now without it, and that we are probably going to be lucky to have as much immigration as we can get for the foreseeable future. However, <laughs> it isn't actually the magic bullet. It doesn't solve everything. It carries its own problems, and it, it could wind up going away whether or not we like it. Plus, and you bring in <clears throat> an example <clears throat> that is worth considering uh, to our present-day con- problems with immigration or policy debate with immigration in that Puerto Rico used to send a, a, a very large uh, number of its people here, and that died off as their fertility rate declined. And yeah. it seems to be Mexico is largely moving in that same direction. Uh, and it's also, you know, it's in its own right, has become a much more attractive place to live. Uh, <clears throat> and then also with Latin America, we also see declining fertility as well. So whether to, you know, our friends to the south can actually continue to send immigrants or will, Seems to me that's very, very debatable at this point. As, as a lot of people have noted, you know, the Mexican immigration wave of, say, roughly 1992 to 2007, 2008 seems largely to be over. I think I've read even, you know, it, it may be the case that more, more Mexicans left America than actually came into this country uh, in the past few years. I wanted to ask you a, on, a, on a different level. So what's different? I mean, and, and I... And maybe there's an obvious answer, but why won't people respond or, or why can't they be uh, alerted to incentives to these sorts of problems you're documenting uh, with, with some policy changes, maybe not even that drastic with, with how we regard the family um, and actually start to turn things around and you could have a return to replacement level or something slightly above replacement level. And do we have, I mean, are any countries, I mean, I think I've read about Quebec, maybe even France, where... Some, some state incentives have, have raised the population level almost to replacement level. Yeah, so, or the so fertility people, have level, been trying, people have been trying to goose the fertility level since, like, dating back to Caesar Augustus. Uh, he passed a bachelor tax to try to goose fertility when they were at the end of the Roman Empire and things were going south. It didn't work. Uh, Joseph Stalin handed out motherhood medals to try to raise the fertility rate in the Soviet Union. They did not work. Uh, as a side note, you can pick one of those things up on eBay for about 12 bucks and... <laughs> They're really actually very Thank cool. you for telling me. I will, I, uh, I will purchase one. I have, I have, I would say, resisted putting one in my wife's Christmas stocking for like three years straight, <laughs> uh, which, you know, it always seems like a clever idea, but I, it would be a terrible idea, of course. This is not something one does in a good marriage. Um, anyway, so, and there are, I would say now today, you know, there are, there are freak show reforms like what Vladimir Putin has done, you know, importing boys to men and coming up with, Mentos campaigns, you know, uh, encouraging people. Well, Free Love Weekend, too, I think I've read about. Right. In fact, they have a national holiday now. Uh, They have two, a a pair of national holidays. There is Family Contact Day, where everybody gets off of work, and the idea is you go home and you make boom, boom for the motherland. And then nine months later (laughs) is Give Birth to a Patriot Day. And if you have your kid on Give Birth to a Patriot Day, like, no kidding, you win a fabulous prize. And so, you know, some people get toasters or microwave ovens. I think the grand prize is a Jeep or a Hummer or something like that. (laughs) <laughs> so the, the, there are freak show initiatives like that. There are what we think of as sort of liberal initiatives, uh, you know, in the crude political sense. And those are things we see in France and the Scandinavian countries, uh, things like uh, massively socialized state daycare centers. Uh, and then there are what I think we could crudely call conservative pronatalist measures. And you'd see this in like Singapore, uh, where there are 
cash incentives to people to have children. I think in Singapore it's ten thousand dollars for the first for the second baby, eighteen thousand dollars for the third baby. They actually have a four hundred one k account for kids in Singapore, where the government matches your spending, matches your savings for child expenses, dollar for dollar. And so you know you put a dollar away into the account to pay for diapers, the government gives you a buck too. Uh, there's been a lot of research on the efficacy of all these policies, and it suggests that they are effective only at the very margins. Uh, one, one survey of the literature suggests that for every 25% increase in state spending on pronatalist policies, you get, I think it is a 0.6% increase in the fertility rate in the short term, and then over the very long term, uh, about a 4% increase. This is not a great ROI. Uh, so, so why? I mean, you know, the question then is why? Why can't you convince people to have kids? And my answer is that because people aren't stupid. Uh, you know, when you try to bribe people into having kids, having kids is a miserable experience in lots and lots and lots of ways. Uh, you know, it it costs a ton of money. It makes you less happy. Uh, there are all sorts of great reasons not to have kids. And so to construct a bribe sufficient to overcome all of those perfectly valid and rational reasons, the bribe would have to be so fantastically expensive that it just wouldn't scale well. Uh, okay, okay. It, I, I wanted to ask you, um, w- with regard to America and the West, and just thinking about the baby boom, um, and I mean, that's an interesting example. Uh, and, and also, generally, fertility levels in the modern period within, say, bourgeois capitalist society seem to hold up fairly well until the Depression, the great you know, World War II. Obviously, there's a decline. I mean, I think we're, we're below replacement level, I've read. Uh, and then we're kind of right at replacement level in the early 20th century in this country. And then the men come home from World War II, and we have the baby boom. Uh, is this just such an exceptional experience that we can't draw any lessons from it, or does it tell us something? And one of the things I thought it, it might tell us, although this is really strange to think about, is actually the New Deal had as its basis kind of the one breadwinner policy, kind of the family wage idea. Uh, and of course, I mean, American industry and at that time stands unprecedented and in a towering position. So there's there are, of course, these sort of stable jobs there. Uh, but is there something we can draw from that? I mean, also, I'm just thinking there is contraception at this time. We haven't yet moved into the regularity of the pill yet, but yet we have a fairly high uh, fertility rate. Yes, you have a whole bunch of things happening for the baby boom. The baby boom, I think, is a perfect illustration of what I say over and over in the book, which is that nobody has a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We need to be really modest in our predictions, and that's, that's what I try to do. I think it's a, a pretty, in that way, a wishy-washy book, and then I'm always saying, you know, well, but, you know, we, we can't really know that it's going to happen. Uh, and if you had said to someone in 1940 that the baby boom was going to happen, they would have thought that you were crazy. But, uh, but so here's that confluence of events. You have, first of all, you still have no college. College winds up being a big driver in depressing fertility for all sorts of reasons, but, but for one sort of very sensible reason, which is that it backs up the time of family formation by at least four years, and that eventually you run up against the wall of biology. Now, what about so the think, GI Bill, though? Right. So, well, the GI Bill comes into effect, but you don't have the massive numbers of people okay. in college until the end of the baby boom. Okay. Exactly, okay. exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so if you think of the reproductive window roughly as something like 18 to 35 or 18 to 39, when you cut four years off of that, once everybody starts going to college, that's going to have some effect. Second, you have enormous gains in middle-class standard of living. Middle-class wages increase fantastically. Uh, this helps. This helps family formation. You have a new, uh, the New Deal, as you suggested, you have a new policy in Social Security, which is providing the idea of security in the long term, but is not yet a burden on families. because Social Security taxes are reasonably low because you have so many taxpayers for each retiree because you're early on in the system. Uh, then you have, actually this is sort of interesting, housing type has always been uh, a driver in fertility. And you have, at the moment of the baby boom, uh, the highest percentage of single-family homes as a percentage of, of housing stock in our nation's history. Single-family homes typically produce more children than do uh, townhouses and apartments, even once you control for other demographic markers. And so you have all these things happening while the old social compacts are still basically in place. You know, there is some contraception, but it's not particularly widespread. Uh, people are still widely adherent to religion. Religion winds up being a very good predictor of fertility. And so sort of the old ways are all still happening while you're getting these big gains and good changes. I say good and not as an objective sense, but just good for fertility uh, in, in other areas. And all of that is what contributes to the baby boom. I want to ask you about um, the Iron Triangle. So, you know, I guess you know, the former Iron Triangle of marriage, sex, and childbearing 
we no longer connect marriage and sex. You know, that this has been true for a while. It seems increasingly we don't connect marriage and childbearing, or at least large numbers of the population don't. Um, we've also got this is what drives these things apart. You write about it, and I don't think this is controversial. It's the pill. <laughs> Divorce later with with you know every jurisdiction in America adopting no fault divorce laws. I I, I want to say about the 1970s. Uh, we've also got delayed marriage, which you noted. We've also got something new in the last two or three decades, which I think is large debt um, uh, from college. We've also got women in college, uh, even outnumbering men now. But women have been in college for quite a while. Uh, and I guess I, you know, it seems to me it really forces the question, and I, I wondered about as I was reading your book, and you say none of this is really a conscious, you know, consciously done to drive down fertility or even to you know, remove the family from these things like childbearing and, and sex. It just sort of, these things just sort of come together through people pursuing uh, you know, different, different purposes, I guess. Uh, but it seems there's also something here that unifies these factors, and that's, I'll say, presentism. Uh, and maybe even a very narrow understanding of individualism. Uh, and it seems to be all kind of driving the question of why, why we have a society where having children is really hard as opposed to being something we just do. I mean, it's just what most people do, and it's kind of easy and something you glide into or slide into as you, you know, become an adult in your 20s. Yeah, you know, I think that's, that's such a good point. It is. It's, it's the idea of the elevation of the present far above I would say, the, the places of both the past and the future in the sort of the way we understand both our lives and sort of the, li- the broader life of the world around us. Uh, and I would say that, again, not, not with any judgmental, uh, judgmentalism in it, um, but that is sort of what's happened. We have all these little evolutions changing. Uh, you know, I would add to all this the rise of cohabitation and the rise of illegitimacy. Yes. You know, 1960, uh, I think 5% of births in America were, were to unwed mothers. These days, it's 40%. Yeah, that yeah. A, that's an astonishing increase, right? Yeah. Uh, and you can see then how that would depress fertility, right? So unwed mothers with a kid, God, you can imagine how much work that is raising a kid by yourself. Uh, it is an enormous disincentive not to do it again. <laughs> yeah. It just becomes harder. It's hard to have multiple children when you're raising kids alone. Uh, and so all this is, is gradually shaping things. But, you know, the thing I keep coming back to in the book is the notion of ideal fertility. And demographers measure uh, the number of kids people say they wish they would have in a perfect world. And I found three surprising things about this in researching the book. The first is that your ideal child numbers changes over time. Uh, it starts reasonably low run your 18, and it gradually increases until you hit about 35, 39. And so the older, the later you are in your childbearing years, the more children you think is ideal. That I think is interesting and not, not particularly expected. The second is that men and women have substantially similar ideas about the number of children that are ideal at all phases of their lives. They both increase, they follow up that curve together, uh, and they, they basically think as one on this, which is, again, interesting and I thought slightly unexpected. But the most unexpected thing is that for all that we hear about people no longer wanting kids and you know, the bourgeois family model being obsolete, in America, our ideal number is 2.5, which is interesting because it's far higher than our actual fertility. But it has been 2.5 for 40 years now. So for two generations, the ideal number has been about the same. And so what that tells me is that all these little evolutions, you know, they, they really are changes that nobody nobody particularly asked for, and we didn't really think through all the way. And the net effect has been to sort of create barriers. And there are, as I said, many other forces at work here, both economic and cultural, but create barriers between the families people want to have and then the families they actually have in the real world. No, I I wanted to ask you uh, as well, you talked about that. So Austria and Germany, with the difference between ideal fertility uh, actual fertility uh, is interesting, uh, and, and something that you've just discussed in America. So at two point five, I, I, I would, real quickly though, I mean, so things that I've read, and particularly after this last election, and trying to sort through uh, the defeat of uh, of the Republican Party, was uh, that you know people in their thirties and twenties have, you know, I was reading, really don't have uh, the same level of expectations for for marriage and children. I mean, have you, have you come across similar sound, sounding data that no, you know, I actually haven't. I've been I've been very interested in in finding that stuff. I haven't seen good data on that stuff yet. That doesn't mean it's not out there. It just means I okay. haven't seen it. Uh, and to a large extent, we won't really know because, of course, whatever somebody in there who's 22 says now expects, we would expect that to be far below the average because people in their 20s typically have a lower ideal conception, and they they then revise that up as they get older and, you know, experience more life and maybe get married, maybe have a first kid and and start to change their mind on these things. Uh, But it will will 
absolutely be fascinating to see in another, you know, I guess yeah. another 15 years. Is this generation different? Is this the generation where the ideal number changes? Because the ideal numbers do move, and that's as you were hinting well, at. It, it was they interesting. move over in Europe. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting as well, just think about the appeal to younger women. Uh, both, I, I think the contraception mandate is an appeal to younger women, uh, uh, among other things, um, but also the way the president campaigned for abortion uh, and these other sorts of reproductive rights, as he calls them, uh, it seemed to be quite striking to me in the way they were narrowly targeted to certain demographic groups. It made me think there is there's maybe something going on that, <clears throat> that I, I wasn't presently aware of. I want to ask you about Austria and Germany, between this ideal and actual fertility, uh, which we actually the ideal fertility in these two countries, you write, is actually sub-replacement level fertility. And you write about the ideal adjusting to reality. And these two countries re- reached sub-replacement fertility the first in Europe. Now, this is this would be a troubling thing if, if this really were to hold in terms of reversing this stuff. Yeah. And this, so when this first popped up about uh, five or six years ago, it was the first time anybody had ever seen an ideal replacement rate anywhere in the world that was sub-replacement. Everyone had just assumed, well, the ideal will always be two kids in a bit, you know, in any, in any normal country. And so demographers have scrambled to try to figure out what was going on. And so the two possibilities were it was a real change or it was just a statistical artifact, because this happens sometimes. You know, surveys happen, and they're not all perfect, and there are margins of error. And what the, the working theory is right now is that these countries have been sub-replacement for so long that the younger generations have revised their idea of what constitutes ideal. They look around, they see very few people have babies, and they think, well, uh, I don't know, so maybe 1.7 kids is fine. Maybe that's okay. And what we've then seen, which supports this, this explanation, is that we have seen a few other countries in Europe pop up also with sub-ideal replacement rates now, or sub-ideal fertility rates, and we've even seen it happen in some Asian countries. Uh, you know, the, the most alarming prospect in all of this is actually China. Uh, China is sitting on its one-child policy, and demographers in China who feel like they can talk about this stuff have been sort of both publicly and privately imploring the government to, to reverse it, turn, you know, turn well, it why off. Why are they so, why do they want to stick to that so much? I mean, that, that amazes me as well. Right. Well, well, here's the thing. That, so the belief seems to be among the, can you say mandarins for the, the chai sure. com bureaucrats? <laughs> sure. <laughs> that is that improper. Sure. Uh, but among the, the chai coms, they seem to believe in the party that uh, well, it's okay when we want more kids, we will just flip ah. the switch and tell people to have more kids. Okay. Well, here's, here's the problem. Uh, there are a couple surveys, and only a couple, which suggest that in parts of China, the ideal fertility rate is now also sub-replacement. In fact, is way sub-replacement. Is right around like 1.5, 1.3. And if that's true, and that's the case, historically, it is almost impossible to get people to have kids that they don't want to have. You can bribe them, you can coerce them, you can do whatever you want. But if Joe Stalin couldn't do it, I don't know that uh, Chinese, you know, modern-day hybrid communists are going to be able to do it, too. Uh, they're, they are sort of playing with fire here, and that's why the demographers in China are so scared. I do. I want to ask you real quickly. Uh, so you talk about. Uh, so let's just talk about economics here. We, we talked about that some, but you have a term. I think it was total factor productivity, um, uh, with regard to nations with you know sub sub replacement fertility, uh, particularly. And I mean, even in America, I think you say our rate has, has certainly been reduced. Of course, abstracting out correlation, uh, all those sorts of factors. But you know, thinking about what well, someone say total factor productivity declines with sub replacement fertility, but what about gains in medical science, health, longevity, um, our technology, our capital? Why? I mean, is it foolish to think we could weather that with, with these other good things going on in developed societies? Uh, and even just in entrepreneurs as well. I mean, would it be the case that we would have a decline in entrepreneurial vitality? Uh, I mean, I can see all sorts of reasons why you would, but is there, are there arguments for it just based on you know how sophisticated we are? Well, I mean, you see a few things going on here. First of all, we would expect a decline in entrepreneurialism and innovation because typically entrepreneurs and innovators do all of their best work uh, between the ages really of 20 and 40. And as those as cohorts get skinnier, you know, which is what happens, then you're mm-hmm. just going to have a smaller pool of people to be coming up with okay. stuff. Now, that doesn't mean that things won't change. Maybe they will. But you have to believe then that all the historical data is is, is wrong and that, or that this time it will be different for some reason. Uh, now, we, what we would expect, the areas where we would expect innovation is healthcare. We would expect there to be lots of innovation in healthcare because that's where all the demand is going to be focused because those bands of people in the older cohorts, that's where all their demand is. Those people don't want to, like, go out and buy new cars every year because they you know, they don't know how long they're going to be here. They're not looking to invest in more real estate. What they are going to want to be buying up is healthcare. 
in a way, actually, that sort of exacerbates the problem because for every sort of medical advance you get helping people live longer, uh, all you're doing is making your population grayer and making your pyramid more top heavy. If you sort of get what I'm so saying. we should give them cigarettes. Uh, you know what? I've just had kidding. some libertarian friends suggest to me that we could solve all of our demographic and social security and entitlement problems by simply going on an expansive cigarette binge. Well, this seems to be this seems to be decriminalize cigarettes. And yeah, no, I, no, I think this seems to be uh, maybe an implicit lesson of the show Mad Men. Um, you know, men die in their late fifties because of uh, you know over overuse of alcohol uh, and cigarettes and bad diets, and maybe the entitlement state kind of works. Uh, and that I, I don't know. Um, I, I was going to ask you. And so, it's a good way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, they're, they're discussing to be having a lot of fun. I wanted to ask you about uh, so world civilization history. Uh, and examples of fall off in population coming not through war, disasters, disease, but through sub replacement fertility. I mean, what what examples should we be aware of? That should keep us up at night. Well, ancient Greece, David Goldman writes about this. You see it in ancient Greece. You see it in the city-states like Sparta. They had this. It led to stagnation and being becoming backwaters. This is what happened at the end of the, the, end of the Roman Empire. Fertility rates then attended the barbarian invasions and all sorts of stuff like that. We had, uh, I would say, it was attended by very bad things when the Black Plague ravaged Europe. Uh, that caused population contraction. But then you look at what's happening today. You look at Greece. You look at Japan look at uh, Italy, frankly, and, and some of the problem spots in Europe. This, we're seeing it right now. We're seeing, you know, it doesn't, having these problems doesn't mean that uh, the four horsemen ride across and your, your land ascends into plague and the earth is salted, but you wind up with, with big problems, big large-scale problems. You know, if you think back to the 1980s when Japan was going to rule the world, and we were, you know, remember the movie Gung Ho was out, and then oh, all yeah. this, this Japanese anxiety here in America about how we were going to have to learn to speak their language if we ever wanted a job, and they were going to they were going to be our new insect overlords. Well, in 1984, Japanese demographers started writing about uh, the impending economic collapse they were going to see because of their fertility rate, and nobody listened to them. And then in 1990, it hit. And we thought that the 1990s were just a lost decade for the Japanese. Well, they're now in year 23 of their lost decade. Uh, and there's now broad consensus that what Japan is actually seeing is the beginning of demographic winter, that that's what it looks like. Now, Japan is a very extreme case. They are further along the cliff than we are. Uh, and, you know, by the grace of God, we will be smart, and we will make better choices than they did, and we won't have it as bad. Uh, but all of this sets up the idea of being in a zero-sum game. Once you have negative growth, then you can't grow your way out of your problems. And everybody's fighting over the same slice of pie. A few, a few weeks ago, fortunately for me, just as I started touring this book around, uh, Japan's finance minister came out and said it was time for the country's old people to, quote, hurry up and die. Uh, Are you kidding me? No, the I'm not. The finance kidding. minister. Yeah, and he didn't lose his job or anything. Uh, so you just, look, I'm, I don't mean to overstate this. I don't think Japan is going to, like, descend into beyond Thunderdome with Grandpa <laughs> Simpson running things or anything. <laughs> That's a shocking statement. But, but I would say that, you know, like, in the West, we, when we encounter these big-scale societal problems, we convene blue ribbon panels, and we have earnest chin-tugging discussions about it. We have Paul Ryan as a vice presidential nominee with his roadmap. But those niceties don't exist everywhere. You know, if you go to Russia, if you go to China, you go to other big places where they're having big problems like this, it is not guaranteed that they're going to solve these problems nicely. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the reason I wrote the book is because I, I thought it was worth us having this discussion here because they're having it everywhere else, uh, over in Asia, over in Europe. This is topic A. This is a, a serious topic of discussion. There's broad agreement by both the left and the right, uh, and they are looking at policy solutions. Frankly, they don't appear to be very many good policy solutions, but they're looking around and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do, and it's, it's worth us having this discussion here as well, I think. I, I went into uh, with, with a couple of uh, thoughts and questions. So, one thing, you mentioned David Goldman earlier, I wanted to ask you, he notes that, that there's a bright spot, and it's Israel, which has, if I remember correctly, a replacement level of like 3 or 2.9 or something like that. Um, and so I was going to get your thoughts. You don't really mention Israel at all in your book in this regard, yet it's, it's also, it's, I mean, there's just a lot of you know, entrepreneurial vitality, um, uh, high rates of education. Um, I mean, there's all these sorts of things going on. I mean, they've got contraception. Uh, and yet, they're, they're, they seem to be prospering with regard to fertility and economically. Uh, and then also, um, you know, switch uh, back to the very bad things. And how bad are they? Uh, so we've just talked about China and I mean Japan and Russia, uh, and also China. Uh, but I guess you know, in the develop the developed world, I mean, so we pay higher taxes and maybe have lower retirement benefits. Uh, I mean, how, how bad is that? I, was, I just want to throw that to you. And then. 
I did find it interesting what you said about China. Um, so, you know, you come down on, people come down on China, I think, really on how much faith they have in market capitalism to transform a country. And so, you know, you find a lot of uh, advocates of the free market, a lot of libertarians not worrying about China because they're going to become more and more capitalistic. Uh, but then you have another group, fear of, obviously, what they're doing, they are planning military uh, buildup and, and st- strategy in that regard. Um, but you have a different tack, which is we actually will have to worry about China because they're an aging society, and by 2050 we'll begin this decline, and we'll have to, you know, who knows how they will act geostrategically. So, I mean, those are kind of the things I want to end with. Uh, that's a lot to throw at you, but um, have at it. Let's work backwards. We'll start sure. with China, and then you can you can tick backwards on the list. Uh, sure. So what, what I suggest about China is that I think China is worrisome, but they are worrisome not because we need to worry about being in a shooting war with them. Uh, And I would say not even particularly because we should worry about being eclipsed by them economically. What worries me is the uncertainty. So if you have a – China is going to have 300 million people, basically, with elderly people, people who are over the age of 65, with no one to support them. Uh, There is no pension system. These are people with no brothers and sisters, very few sons or daughters to take care of them. What happens with them? So does China alter its ambition to start cutting defense spending and prop up some sort of entitlement program to take care of them? Uh, if they do that, do they, or if they don't do that, do they uh, raise taxes radically on their workers, risking making those guys unhappy? You know, plus you have this atomized society where for the first time in human history, you do have a billion people where almost everyone is a singleton. You know, there aren't a lot of brothers and sisters or aunts and uncles. People, people are their own people on their own ship at sea. Uh, what I worry about about China is what happens when all of this sort of hits a destabilizing tipping point. You know, does China fall into internal revolution? Does it become unpredictable in some other way? Uh, and that's what I think actually Americans ought to be thinking about when it comes to China is, is the looming possibility of, of dramatic instability in their societal order. Okay. So, okay, so work backward with me then, uh, tick, tick backward with me through the rest of the list. Okay, sure, sure. Very bad things. I mean, how bad is the bad, say, for, for developed Western countries? Uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm just thinking, you know, Lower retirement benefits, higher taxes, maybe a, you know, instead of two percent or three percent economic growth, two point five percent or something like that. I mean, just you know, um, going going through worst case scenario. So what? Okay, so so two things. First of all, if it was just us, if it was just America, then I wouldn't have written the book because the truth is, if it was only our problem and we were unique, then we would just muddle through it. And, you know, maybe things would be rough for 40 years. Maybe we'd have a stagnant economy for 40 years, but we would have figured something out. Uh, the problem is that it's not us. It's, it's worldwide. And this is the dominoes are going to start falling, you know, beginning with Japan, where they're already having this problem, and South Korea and Singapore and China, and then just sort of moving across the globe westward. And the problem then becomes what happens when everybody's falling off the cliff in rapid succession? Does that create, you know, real instability problems? What does it create global financial downturns? We don't know. We're in undiscovered territory. But the other reason is, because we don't know where the fertility decline stops. Uh, one of the more interesting theories out there is called the theory of the second demographic transition by a pair of European demographers. Oh, good. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah Ron Lefebvre and Dirk Manikov, very smart guys. And what they propose is that this fertility decline is inevitable and that this is a fundamental change in the human experience with modernity and that people will constantly want fewer and fewer children because having kids just isn't fun. It isn't part of what the human experience is like anymore. And if their theory is correct, and if it holds, and there's lots of evidence to suggest it might be correct, then there's no reason that fertility rates stop at 1.9, you know, as they are as they are presently here in America. Why wouldn't, over the course of the next 50 years, they continue falling? They certainly have everywhere else. Uh, you know, there is one of the most depressing things is there are no examples of countries which hit the replacement rate and stop. Nobody just sort of settles in at 2.1 and hangs out there for the long haul. Uh, everybody keeps falling. And that's I would say the other worrisome part, and that's, that's why I say we, we need to worry about what the direction is here and what all the mass consequences are once that pileup starts happening country after country. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.